Okay, uh, about this uh, homework that uh, is circulating, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was good. However, be careful when you are using a theorem, like the intermediate value theorem. Uh, in particular, most of you lost points because uh, you define a new function. So you knew that the function f was continuous, and then you define the function g as being g of x equal to f of x minus x, let's say. But you, you use the intermediate value theorem for g. Well, you have to explain to me why g is continuous. Okay? You cannot forget that. So every time you use a theorem, you need to check your hypothesis. It's the extreme value theorem. You check that you are on a bounded, closed interval, and you have a continuous function. It's the intermediate value theorem. You check that you have a continuous function on that interval. Okay? So be very precise, and don't forget to justify your, your use of a theorem. Okay, so let's uh, start 5.3. And we, we are going to talk about uh, well-known formulas, formulas that you have been using in calculus for a long time. And that, so what, uh, what we need here is the following. So assume that uh, f and g are defined on an open interval. <coughs> I assume that I belongs to I. A belongs to I. That uh, uh, what else? We need that uh, c is a constant. And assume that f and g are differentiable at a. Then we have that cf is differentiable at a, and cf prime of a is. C F prime of A. Then uh, F plus G is also differentiable at A. And F plus G prime of A is F prime of A plus G prime of A. F G is differentiable at A. And Fg prime is F prime A G of A plus F of A G prime of A. And if G of A is different from zero, then F over G is differentiable at A and f over g prime a is uh, f prime a g of a minus f of a g prime of a. So all these are well-known formulas uh, that you, you have used. And we are, just, we are going to prove a, a couple of them. How, how we use our definitions to, to prove that. Let's see. 
So we are uh, just going to apply the definition. We have that hn goes to 0, that hn is always different from 0. And then uh, we are looking, for instance, at cf of a plus hn minus cf of a over hn. Okay, we examine the ratio, and we want to show that this ratio has a limit as hn as n goes to uh, to infinity. Now we can, of course, factor out the c and get c f of a plus h n minus f of a n f of a over h n, and this converges to c f prime of a because c is a constant. This converges to f prime of a because we're assuming that f is differential with a. Okay, so by operations on limits, we get c f prime of a. And i is proved because this shows that c f prime of a is c f prime of a. For 2i, we would do uh, f plus g of a plus hn minus f plus g of a over hn. Which uh, we can split in two pieces, f of a plus h n minus f of a over h n plus uh, g of a plus h n minus g of a over h n. This converges to f prime of a. This converges to g prime of a. So by operation on limits, the sum converges to f prime of a plus g prime of a. Okay. So this thing here is going to converge to f prime of a plus g prime of a. So that proves this form as well. Now, for the product, we need to work a little harder because, OK, what we get is FGA plus HN minus FG of A over HN. So we rewrite this. Um, so let me. So how do we rewrite this? Well, <coughs> simply as f of a plus hn minus f of a, because that's what we, we want, times g of a plus hn plus f of a Uh, G of A plus HN minus G of A over HN. So let's check first that the algebra is right. Uh, what we need is a product F of A plus HN, G of A plus HN. We do get that. That product is here. We also want the product f of a uh, times g of a with a minus, which is what we get here. And then there are two values that we don't have there, 
and should cancel each other so that we do have, we do have an equality. So what are these values? Well, we have f of a times g of a plus hn here with a minus, and we have f of a times g a plus hn with a positive here. So that's fine, the two cancel, and this is indeed equal to that. Okay? So we just add and subtract in order to have things that we want. Now, this thing, we know what it converges to. It converges to f prime of a by definition. So we are fine. What about this guy? What happens to this guy as n goes to infinity? Why does it go to g of a? And what property of a function g? The function g is continuous. Yes, you are using that the function g is continuous, and therefore g of a plus hn goes to g of a. And the function g is continuous, why? Because it's differentiable, and differentiable is stronger than continuous. So we know it's continuous. Okay? So, So G is differentiable at A implies that G is continuous at A implies that G plus G of A plus A H N E converges to G of A. And that's because A, a plus H N converges to, to A. So we have this. Now, the other, the other terms are, so this converges to f prime of a, this to g of a. This is a constant. This is f of a. We don't have to, to worry about. And this, is, this converges to g prime of a. Okay, so we, ha we get exactly our formula. We, we get that um, f g of a plus h n minus f g of a over hn converges to f prime of a g of a plus f of a g prime of a. Okay. The, the ratio formula is similar, a little worse, but uh, not significantly. I won't do that, but you can, you can have a look at uh, uh, what's written here. So that gives us the first operation from differentiable functions. OK. Um, yes, so let's uh, use those for polynomials and So first example, polynomials are differentiable everywhere. So what, what we know already is that the function, so fk, if we, we know that fk is differentiable everywhere. Okay, we proved that already. And then a polynomial, P, is really a sum of Cn Fn plus Cn minus 1, Fn minus 1, plus C1F1 plus C0. Okay, it's really a linear combination of terms of this type. Okay, Cn x to the power n, and then you, and your n is a natural. And now what you have is 
by operations on differentiable functions that Vc is differentiable, and you are adding differentiable functions, you know the sum of differentiable functions is differentiable. Okay? So P is the sum of differentiable function. Therefore, it's differentiable. And of course, you can compute the uh, derivative explicitly since you know how to compute the derivative of each piece. So uh, any polynomial is going to be differentiable. And it's differentiable everywhere at any A. Rational functions are differentiable where defined. And that's easy to see, too, because a rational function is going to be p over q, and q, uh, p and q are polynomials. Polynomials are differentiable. So p over q is differentiable at a if q of a is different from 0. That's the property for i that we just mentioned. And you have a nice formula to compute the derivative of a, of a ratio of two functions that are differentiable. OK, another uh, important property is the chain rule. And uh, so what we're going to state now. So we assume that f is differentiable on an open interval i. Uh, actually, OK. So f is defined on an open interval i. And uh, uh, differentiable at a. which belongs to i, then g is defined on an open interval j that contains the range of f. and is differentiable at f of a. Okay. So you need 100 hypotheses, but they all make sense. I mean, if you want to talk of f of g of x, uh, you need to have that. Otherwise, you, you cannot, you know, the, your definition doesn't make sense. So, uh, and then you have, so uh, at, if you have this, then f Composed, so it's G composed with F, given what? So G composed with F is differentiable at A, and it is its derivative at A can be computed. This is the general G prime of F of A times F prime of A. Uh, 
Uh, the proof is not bad, but it's a little long. And uh, uh, the idea is to say the following. Um, well, you need that. Let me just give you an idea of how the proof goes. We're not going to do it for me. Um, yeah. Yeah, the idea is that um, because we have A of A plus H minus F of A over H converging to F prime of A, we can say that uh, F of A plus H minus F of A over H, can you see this thing? Uh, I cannot, but so uh, you can you can write your ratio as being f prime of a your limit plus something, and the something goes to zero as h goes to zero. Okay, then uh, you get that your f of a plus h uh, is equal to f of a plus h prime of h times f prime of a plus h times r of h so what you are what you're saying here is that uh, because your function is differentiable near a it's almost a linear function okay this is a linear function in h plus something but the something goes to zero twice. I mean, it, uh, it goes to zero kind of faster, faster than h in any case. Why? Well, r of h goes to zero. And I'm multiplying something going to zero by h. So it's like it's going to zero faster than h. Therefore, this, this is why I can say that my approximation, my linear approximation works. So what you do for the chain rule is you, you write now g of f of a plus h. You see, you, you would have g of f of a plus h. And so you write that this is g of f of a plus h f prime of a plus h r of h. But now you say g is differentiable at f of a. Therefore, g has also a linear approximation near f of a. And the, so why am I near f of a? Well, oh, I keep doing this. Uh, it's because this thing here is small. So I need to write g as I wrote f. And you can imagine it's going to get messier because this is not, this plays the role of h. And I need something else to play the role of r. So it keeps expanding. And it's a good thing that we don't do a chain rule for three functions. Otherwise, you can imagine. But so it's not bad, but you need to write this properly. Okay. And what happens is that when you expand this near f of a, you get what you have there. You get g prime of f of a times f prime of a. And the, the, whole, the rest of the thing gets small. So you see the objective after some suffering here is to get to g prime of f of a plus, uh, no, times f prime of a uh, actually, yeah, so I first need to get g of f of a plus uh, g prime of f of a times f prime of a times h plus another r, uh, so Let's call it capital R, H, capital R of H. Okay. If I'm able to do my computations and end up with this thing, I know I'm done. Because now, I, uh, this is proving that uh, G composed with F has a linear approximation near 
a, f of a near a, and uh, this is the linear approximation. Therefore, it's differential. Okay, so so that's what you do. You do you know some type, of, some messy computations, but the end result should be this. Okay, so why do we why why are we interested in uh, derivatives? Well, there are lots of applications. You can when you have derivatives, you can use them to uh, look for local extrema. Oh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thanks. I knew there. There was a reason why these markers were in a corner of my room. Next time I'll try them. <coughs> so yeah, we are going to use this to uh, to apply this notion of uh, differentiability to different. Uh, to, to studying functions, that's the main thing. So, So first thing, um, what the definition? So assume that f is defined. On an open interval. I and that A belongs to I, then F is said to have a local extremum, well, local maximum, at A if there is a delta such that for all x in A minus delta, A plus delta, f of x is bigger than or equal to f of a. Okay, so this is an example of a local maximum. You have an interval around your point where this is the highest point of a graph. It's not an absolute maximum because it goes up, it's uh, higher here, for instance. So you cannot say that you have a global maximum in this case. But you do have a local maximum. Okay, of course, this would be a local minimum. Okay? So that's... Uh, what we call local extrema. And what's interesting about extrema and differentiability is the following. It's a maximum, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, you are right. Thank you. OK, and for, for a minimum, of course, you reverse your inequality. Property. So um, So f is defined 
on the open interval I. Um, and if F has a local extremum at A, in I, then F prime of A needs to be equal to zero. Well, oh, I didn't, uh, I didn't say that F is differentiable. So we need two things. We need F defined on open interval I, and F is differentiable at A belonging to I. This works only if your function is differentiable. It's not going to work. So how do we prove that? Well, um, so local ex extremum could be a minimum or a maximum. Let's assume that F has a local minimum. at A. Then there is a delta such that A minus delta, A plus delta is included in I. Why can I say that? Why can I say that I can find a delta so that A minus delta, A plus delta is in I? Yes? For A to be a local minimum, we have to have a down No, that, that's not related to the function. That's really related to the set I. What, what is particular to the set I that allows us to say something like that? It's an open interval. Okay, because it's an open interval, because I is open, I have A here, and I don't know how I is, but I know A is not a boundary of I. If it were, then A would not be in I. Okay, so I know there is some room around A, and I'm still in I. And we did this, uh, we, we did it at least in particular cases. Remember, uh, if, if you, uh, I think we had A in 0, 1, and I asked you to find a D, or to show that there was a D, so that A minus D, A plus D was entirely in 0, 1. But you can do that in general. And, and the idea is that your A is not a boundary point of your set. And therefore, you're not going to, to go outside by, by taking a small interval. So that's why the open here, we are using the open interval assumption. Uh, we are definitely using it. OK, so we have this. So now uh, we take we take for H n yeah. well, the other thing uh, we can say is that there is a delta one. <coughs> such that if x belongs to a minus delta 1, a plus delta 1, then f of x is bigger than f of a. OK? 
Okay, that's because of our definition of, of a minimum. So A is a local minimum. So now take for H n uh, delta over 2 n. The first delta we have there. Then H n goes to 0, clearly, because I have a constant divided by 2 n, so it has to go to 0. And H n is different from 0 for every n. Now, uh, there exists an n so that if n is bigger than capital N, then delta over 2n is less than delta 1. Why can I say that? Why can I say that there is a capital N so that above capital N, delta over 2N is less than delta 1? Yeah, that's my epsilon. Okay, This sequence goes to 0. So uh, absolute value of delta over 2N minus 0 in absolute value is less than delta 1. But that's exactly this number here. Okay, So that's the definition of converging to 0. So I know I can do this. Now, <coughs> OK, so now we can write that f of a plus h n is uh, bigger than f of a for n bigger than capital N. We can do that because um, a plus h n is in my interval a minus delta 1, a plus delta 1. Okay, We can do that since a plus hn, which is a plus delta over 2n, is less than a plus delta 1. Okay, so, so I'm close enough to a so that this guy is above this one. Now we do f of a plus hn minus f of a over hn, which is a positive number, is positive for n bigger than capital N. Okay, all I'm doing is putting this guy on this side and dividing by hn, which is a positive number, and I get this. Now we let n go to infinity, and we get f prime of a. Because we, we are assuming that our function is differentiable, so this thing needs to go to f prime of a. And by operation on limits, the large inequality doesn't change, and we get 0 on this side. So f prime of a needs to be positive or 0. <coughs> now, we do. Uh, the same thing from the left now. We say that Kn is minus Hn. So this time you are taking a, a sequence of negative numbers going to 0. And we are going to say that again, uh, K A plus Kn belongs to the right set, a minus delta 1, a plus delta 1, when for n bigger than capital N. 
Okay, because you you make it you make your KN small enough so that it's less than delta one. So you are in a minus delta one, a plus delta one, and then f of a plus kn is bigger than f of a. And f of a plus kn minus f of a over kn. So this time, is it smaller than 0 or larger than 0? Smaller, right? Because kn is negative. We are dividing by kn on both sides. So this time, it's negative. And but same thing as before, your n, as your n goes to infinity, this goes to f prime of a, which this time we find to be negative or 0. So the only solution is to have f prime of a equal to 0, and we're done. Now, uh, how important is this open interval stuff? We have used it. That's, that's right. But uh, sometimes you use a property that you don't really need. I mean, the property may be true in general, but uh, because your, your proof is not the best possible, you, you have used something you didn't really need. But that's not the case here. Okay? If you look at uh, uh, the function f of x equal x, on the interval 0, 1 closed, clearly you're, you have a minimum at x equals 0 and a maximum at x equals 1. But f prime of 0 is not 0. Uh, actually, we don't really have an f prime. We have half a tangent, okay? because it's only defined uh, to the right of 0. But clearly, you see what ha what's going on here is that you have a closed interval, and therefore, you, there is no guarantee that you have a derivative equal to 0 when you have a closed interval. Okay? So this example shows that the interval i needs to be open. To conclude that f prime of phase. So the proof doesn't apply, but maybe the property is still true. 
right? I mean, the proof clearly cannot cannot be used because then we have this problem, uh, and and it's crucial in the proof to look from the left and the right, because that, that's what we do. But that doesn't prove that uh, you cannot find a better proof for which the property is true. But by the definition of local extreme, those two endpoints aren't candidates. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you are, yeah. No, that's a good point. So so if we define well. So but you know, if we change that definition as well. But uh, in fact, uh, I take that back because what what we are saying for a definition of local extremum is that there must exist a delta, so that for every x in a minus delta a plus delta, uh, f of x is let's say bigger than f of a. Okay, that's our definition. But I claim that this definition is okay with my example here. Zero qualifies as a minimum, as, as a local minimum. I, because I'm not saying that this interval is necessarily in my domain. I'm only saying if you know x is in my domain and in this interval, then this is a true statement. So that would work here. We don't need to send you the definition for that. Okay? But uh, the proof clearly doesn't work. Because for the proof, yes, I do need to have to be able to take a sequence uh, to the left of A and to the right of A. And I cannot do that in a case like that. OK, so that's one example. <coughs> this is too long. Okay, let's uh, uh, maybe state uh, an important uh, theorem, which So Cauchy was this uh, French mathematician from 19th century who participated in the effort to make a calculus rigorous. And, uh, unfortunately, at some point, he decided he was a fierce uh, monarchist. And he decided that he would be the tutor of uh, the possible future king of France. And, uh, but the, the kid wasn't that gifted in math and never became king anyway. So he wasted his time, kind of, I think, uh, by doing that instead of doing mathematics. But anyway, <coughs> so what does this theorem say? Well, first thing, you have two functions, which are continuous on a closed and bounded interval and differentiable on the open interval. So you have f and g, which are continuous on the closed bounded interval A B and differentiable on the, the open interval A B. <coughs> okay. Then there is a real C in A B open such that f of b minus f of a times uh, uh, yeah, g prime of c is equal to g of b minus g of a times f prime of c. Uh, for us, this will be more like a lemma. Okay, it's not it's not the mean value term that you should memorize. Okay, but it's useful to prove what we want to prove. This is very useful uh, to to prove L'Hopital's rule, which is beloved apparently in this country. Okay, so that's that's how we, you would prove uh, uh, L'Hopital's rule is by using this particular form of a mean value term. Anyway, so uh, we are not going to talk about the proof of this at this point, 
but We are going to see uh, a couple of applications of it. So the first one, and that's the mean value theorem that you need to know. It's the Lagrange mean value theorem. OK, so that's, that's uh, the mean value theorem we'll uh, We'll be talking about. Okay, that's that's the one you need to know. And simply says the following again that if f is continuous on a b closed, differentiable on a b open, then there exists a c in a b such that um, well I, I, I need to write it like yeah uh, f of b minus f of a is f prime of c times b minus a So could you give me a one line proof to go from here to there? Without looking at the one book? Without looking at that. So what's the difference between this formula and that formula? There is a G. It's a particular G. What what is the G that I'm using in the second one? So g of b is b, g of a is a, which means that g of x is x. Okay? So if we use that, <coughs> if we use g of x is x, first thing, we check our hypothesis. Is g good enough? Well, g is continuous on a, b, that's for sure. It's continuous everywhere. And it's differentiable. On a, on a B open. So that's fine, okay, in order to use the Cauchy mean value theorem. So by the Cauchy mean value theorem, we get uh, F of B minus F of A times G prime of C. So what is G prime of C? What is G prime of X? One. So we get times one here equal to g of b minus g of a times f prime of c. But, OK, I, I shouldn't write the g here. We are taking g equal. So it's b minus a. <coughs> That's exactly what we, what we want, right? So once we have that one, this one, of course, is a particular case. But that's, that's the one that uh, is, uh, is important to us. <coughs> and then uh, there is an even more particular case. But because these particular cases are so important in analysis, they have names. And that's the so-called Rolle's theorem. So Rolle's theorem tells me that if f is continuous on a, b, differentiable on a, b open, then there exists a c in a, b open such that f prime of c is zero. OK? 
Okay? And again, we prove his one line. Use the mean value theorem tells you that f of b minus f of a is f prime of c times b minus a. For a c, okay, the mean value term tells you that there is a c in a b, so that this is true. But in this case, you're assuming that, <coughs> uh-oh, I lost one hypothesis. Okay, so. We need, of course, to have f of b equal to f of a. I need to write this somewhere. Okay, it's the particular case when f of b is equal to f of a. So with this assumption, this is 0. And then for f prime of c is 0. There is really nothing to do. Yes? How do we know that b minus a is 1? No. We don't. But <coughs> you have a product which is equal to 0. And OK, you need to assume that b is not a. Yeah. So your how product. Do you, how do you know it's not, for example, b could be 4 and a is 2, then you have 2 times f prime of c. Right. So if I have 2 times f prime of c equals 0, f prime of c is 0. <laughs> it's only the, the only problem here is to have b minus say different from zero, which you know we assume because otherwise we are not talking about an interval but about a point. Okay. <clears throat> Questions on these uh, mean value terms? So you really should know uh, this one. And it will, uh, that's, that's the one we'll be using over time for different things. Oh, maybe I should assign some homework. So, 5.3. We are going to do 2, 3, Four, five, six, and seven. <clears throat> Questions? Okay, so let's stop here for today. Um, one, uh, twenty-six. One week from Thursday. <coughs>